Tim, what is it about these bugs in a box? <laughs> there's no way to there's no way to shrink it down. I, I there's no words that can describe it. Um, they uh, they bring a healing. You just you either know or you have to know. Um, the smell of a, a healthy hive, once you smell it, you'll never forget it. But uh, just th the ability to get up, take take your health in your own hands. See, that's what we have to do. The the desire to work these bees and uh, the, the healing you get from it. It's uh, something about a box full of bugs, you know what I'm saying? It, uh, it's got a healing to it. Mike, what is it about those bugs in a box? Wow, those bugs in a box. There's something about them. It's, a, it's an insect that can do so much. So, so many functions it has, so many things it has within itself. And we get to manipulate it. God allowed us to manipulate his creation and do the things we can do. We can, we can make products from it. And it's just exciting to sit there and be able to uh, propagate them and, and manipulate them and watch them do their thing and explode on you and watch the direct results of what you do. To me, it's nothing like it. It's a, it's like a, almost an addiction when you when you get to do this and you have this this uh, ability given to you to do this. So, to me, that's what they are. They're just amazing, amazing insects. Randy. What is it about those bugs in a box? There's just something magical about those bugs in a box. I don't know a whole lot of beekeepers that don't have a watching chair or, or some way to sit out and just watch their bees. You just watch them work. It's just something, it's like watching a, a campfire. It's like sitting around at midnight watching a campfire. You're out there by yourself and it's quiet. But you, I do the same thing with my bees. They don't know all there is to know. I'll never know all there is to know, but there's so much to learn. It's, it's all so interesting. And it brings together a community, uh, well, the, in, in the way we're doing it with YouTube and with other things, it brings together a community of like-minded people that, that are, we're, we're all a little off, kind of. It's relaxing, it's fun, and I'll be doing it from now on, just like you, I'm sure. Bruce, what is it about those bugs in a box? Man, I don't know. It's addictive from the day I first opened one up. I just, you know, it's therapeutic to me. It's always an adventure and I just never know what to expect. And it's just a, very miraculous to me how they do what they do. And um, I don't know what it is. It's just something, there's an it about it that, that is just addicting that I just love. And uh, I guess it's a way to interact fully with nature. and. Uh, it's like opening a gift. Every time you open one, you never know what you're going to expect. It's a surprise and uh, so many things to learn, so many things to do, and so many things you can do with it, and I just love it. Uh, if you ever doubt that there's a guy, just open a beehive and look at the bees because th there's just no way that just happened randomly. There's definitely something divine about that, and it, uh, I just love it. What is it about these bugs in a box that keeps us coming back, that keeps us working them in the rain, traveling across the, the, uh, the country? And the heat. And the heat, the snow, the rain. Snow? That's the snow. Story. That's a long story, right, Tim? <laughs> oh. there, there is just something snow. about the bees, and I think the bees are just the conduit to people. Bees are a conduit to a connection that's way greater than ourselves. We can't fully understand what it is, but we're drawn to it. As we've heard folks talk about, there's a healing with the bees, mental, physical, spiritual. It ties people together, makes those connections, it brings us all together, it fulfills uh, a part of us that the result of engaging with the bees, the result of that action, the consequence of that action is joy and happiness. What is it exactly about those bees? I don't think I'll ever know but I think I'll spend all my days trying to find out.
Well, hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the uh, Stream Team Beekeeping Chat. Uh, I'm really looking forward uh, to tonight, guys. Uh, how's everyone doing tonight? Doing good. Doing good. Yeah. Well, uh, tonight we have a special guest, Bob Benny. Uh, he in the bottom right corner. We have uh, our regular Bruce Jenny. Bruce is bees. Bottom, at least my bottom left. And then we have uh, we've got Brian Coper, Castle Hives up there behind the scenes, making sure. All the things are plugged in and lights are on and things are looking good. So I appreciate you guys uh, taking time tonight to talk about bees. Uh, it, you saw in that last little intro in that video there, you, you noticed there was a lighthouse um, and it's it's there. That particular lighthouse uh, was was built in the late 1800s. Um, that particular lighthouse we just visited um, about a month ago uh, and it's there on Sanibel Island. Um, if you've uh, if you're familiar with what's going on, I'm not sure how you can't be. Uh, when when uh, Hurricane Ian came through, it absolutely decimated all those bridges, all that entire area, uh, wiped out all those old historical buildings. Um, but what's interesting is you know what still stands is that old lighthouse. And there's there's a lot we could say um, about how important that is. I think we all, whether it's uh, storms um, in life, uh, storms as we grow the farm uh the, our, our beekeeping um, enterprises or careers you know sometimes it feels like we are that ship at sail on rough seas in the dark uh you're taking on water and you feel like you're heading right towards the rocks and every now and again you'll see up there on the hill uh, is a lighthouse and that lighthouse is, is showing us the way maybe showing us safe harbor giving us some direction um, and uh, I, I can say without a shadow of a doubt, tonight's guest has been a lighthouse for so many, uh, including myself, um, and with our beekeeping career, uh, the choices that we've made. He's been an, an absolutely um, incredible influence um, on our beekeeping, um, but also who he is as a person. Uh, and tonight, it is our absolute great honor uh, to introduce our special guest tonight, Mr. Bob Benny. Bob, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Those are some pretty kind words. Now I'm going to have, Craig, you shouldn't have done that. Now I have to live up to all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, thank you. Yeah, it's good to be here. It's, uh, you know, and, and all the different parts of the country, we're kind of all going through um, the different uh, phases of the year. Up here in Ohio, it's, it's nature's grand finale. Um, the dogwoods are just fire red. The maples are orange. It's a sea of white aster and goldenrod. I don't know that you can be a beekeeper um, and, and not appreciate the actual, the art of nature, the colors, the textures, the sounds, the shapes, and to be able to appreciate um, the beauty right in front of us. And Bob, you have had, I mean, decades and decades of experience, not only keeping bees, um, but fine tuning your art of beekeeping. And I thought tonight, maybe we could get into a little bit um, of the, the mindset, um, but also the art of beekeeping. That's going to be a little bit different for everybody, but I can only yeah. imagine the, all the, the, all your experience, um, and all the canvases that you have painted and put away and bring a new canvas on. So I'd really like to paint just to kind of get into the mind of Bob Benny a little bit okay. um, and talk about, um, the art of beekeeping. But the first question I've got to ask is Bob, what is it? about these bugs in a box for you? Oh, I don't know. You know, I, I listened to that very, that was a very interesting intro. And I'm much different than almost anybody I know. Hmm. I was attracted to the business of beekeeping. When I first read that, the uh, first book I read was uh, How to Keep Bees and Sell Honey by Walter T. Kelly. It was published in 1955. And I was just intrigued by the idea of uh, you know, possibly making a living at beekeeping. I was attracted to the business end. And of course the bees have become, the bees themselves have become very interesting, but uh, um, you know, my, my initial attraction was different than almost anybody I know. It was about the business end, it really was. I, and you know, being in business with bees has uh, allowed me to uh, be creative in ways that not many businesses would have you know, how do you describe that? Um, I mean, it, it's endless uh, thinking, obviously. You're always trying to outguess Mother Nature, which is almost impossible, but you try. You got to try, right? I guess that's really part of the art of beekeeping. 
trying to outguess, you know, what the future is going to bring. I often say you need a crystal ball in this business. And boy, wouldn't I be rich if I had one? Um, the art of beekeeping, that's an interesting concept. We were just talking about it yesterday. I, I brought that up with my crew. We're feeding right now. And normally by now we're beginning to thicken up our syrup in order to get the colonies good and heavy for winter. And uh, we're, we're and just today we uh, mixed another batch of thin syrup. We're still running uh, thinner than one to one. And uh, they were question, questioning me about that. And they say, why aren't we doing what you you tell everybody else to do? And, you know, <laughs> and I said, it's because I'm looking at the weather forecast here and we've got two weeks of at least two weeks before frost. There's there's no uh, temperatures in the 30s at night for at least two weeks in our forecast. And I, wow. said, I said, guys, that's the art of beekeeping. You know, you got to be mm. willing to shift and change and go with the flow and try to explain what I meant by I, I literally just yesterday was talking about the art of beekeeping with the crew. And, uh, you know, the art, the word art that you alluded to in the beginning with the beautiful portraits and the leaves on the trees, you know, that's all considered art. But if you if you look up the word art in the sense that we're talking about right now in the Merriam-Webster dictionary, the definition you get is the skill that is acquired through experience. That's the art of beekeeping. And that's not anything you can teach somebody. You don't, you can't read that in a book at all. It has to come through experience. And mm -hmm. a very wise man once said that uh, um, uh, wisdom is not assimilated with the eyes. It's assimilated with the atoms. I mean, and then he went on to say, you can't really... Uh, expound on anything uh, with uh, what would be the right word with authority until it becomes a part of your whole being and mm. that's that's when you have the wisdom of anything whether you're a plumber or a master carpenter you know it's the experience that gets you to that point and mm -hmm. the art of beekeeping really really does come with experience you you can't learn it in a year you can't learn it in three years it just it takes repetition you know you got to open that bee box a lot of times to really get that wisdom that gives you, that, 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 you know, gives you that art of beekeeping. Mm -hmm. I don't, that might sound odd, but, um, you know, I look at the, the word master beekeeper a little different. I, I recognize and I absolutely think that the master beekeeping programs that are out there are brilliant, um, worth going after. But honestly, when I think of the word master beekeeper, I look at it in a little different light. It's not anything you can, it's not answers on a test. It's not something you read in a book and take a test on later. It's, it's not community service. It's, it's years and years of experience that, 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 you know, give you that mastership. And when you have that, you know, you, you've got a handle on the art of beekeeping. Does that sound crazy? No, that, that oh. sounds spot on. And, and I think if you, you know, in, in my limited experience uh, on this earth is if you go seek out um, a master, that title is, is typically not one they're even will hold um, or um, even take responsibility for. They're, they're, they are practicing the craft of whatever that they're doing with no title. Yeah. And the really, really good ones are the ones in, in, in my um, experience are the ones that aren't looking for the title. There is no ego or pride. Mm -hmm. They are just exercising the art of whatever that it is blacksmithing, beekeeping, farming, mm. you name it, They're, they are so engaged in the act and the art of that the title and the nomenclature means nothing. Yeah, I never thought about that, but you're absolutely right. Yeah, the, the, the humble people are, are some of the best masters at any craft are the mm -hmm. humble ones. Yeah, you're right. I tell yeah. you, Bob, when, uh, you know, <clears throat> last year when I was out uh, running around with you guys working some of the bee yards, I, I'll never forget it. And I've told the story several times. But, you know, I'm in the back seat. Uh, you and um, Jesse are up front and you guys are, are laying out the day. And of course, I'm walking into the operation, not knowing what happened yesterday or last week or the month and not knowing what all the plans for are, are in the future. And you guys are kind of laying all the things out, you know, going to the cell yard, do this, do that. We need this many cells. We're going to do this. We're going to go check on these couple yards. We have to grab all these, you know, make up the nukes, take the nukes out and go through all these things. And it was such a it was it was complicated it was simple it was simply complicated there was a certain organization <laughs> within the chaos that was nothing short of beautiful but i can remember sitting back there thinking wow and i asked you the question 
And I said, Bob, at what point in your career did you feel like you knew what you were doing? And you looked back and you smiled and you said, there's days that I still don't know what I'm doing. That, that, that's a good answer. <laughs> that's the right answer. <laughs> I'm glad I was smart enough to give you the right answer. Yeah, no, it's true. Yeah, there's the days when we sit here and look at each other. I'm in my office right now. You've seen it. The chairs are over there where the crew sits. Every morning we have this little five or ten minute, you know, shoot the breeze and figure out what we're going to do for the day. And there's days when I arrive and I don't know what I'm going to do. I kind of bounce it off them. What did you guys see yesterday? And some of it just evolves in the moment, honestly. That's I shouldn't even admit that. People think I'm this brilliant business person. I'm not. I'm just holding on to the wheel and hope the tires <laughs> don't spin off. You know? <laughs> Well, you, you laugh about that, but I, the first hearing you say that, the I'll never forget the feeling of, I don't know if elation is the right word, or um, I felt off like I was off the hook. Like I didn't have to have all the things figured out all the time. I don't have to okay. predict every outcome. I can yeah. literally just, uh, just, go with the breeze you know see where the day goes and the week goes and how the yeah. colony goes and the yard or the pallet or the day or the and yeah. there was a certain freedom that i had never felt ever in beekeeping because you just had that you turned around and smiled and said that one thing that's a big deal well you know th this here this little item right here dictates my day quite often <laughs> <laughs> you know the, the, you can guess which app on this phone is used the most right the weather yeah. app Right. <laughs> that dictates a lot of stuff. You can make all the planning in the world, but the weather can change things in a, in a heartbeat for you. You got to be flexible in this business. If, if you're rigid and you're unable to go with the flow, you know, failure is probably in your future. If you're trying to be a beekeeper, you've got to be able to be flexible and and then, uh, you know, shift direction at any moment because of some little thing that happens, you know. <laughs> Every day, there's not a day that goes by that we don't change our mind on something because of something we see in the field or what the weather's doing or, you know, or, or maybe an employee doesn't show up that day because they're sick and suddenly we've got to change everything. So if you're going to be ses successful in the bee business, you've really, really got to be flexible. Have you always been so flexible uh, and be able to, to go with the breeze or is this something that has developed over time or is this something that you learned um, from a mentor as well? I don't know. I maybe it's a lack of being able to. Uh, you know, I've never, you know, lined out my week. You know, literally, some people get out of, you know, a, some sort of paper and pencil and have a dates and times, and this is what's going to happen on that day. I've never been that way. I just, you know, greet the day. Every day is a brand new day and mm -hmm. new challenges. And sort of course, some things have to happen on a given day if you're raising queens or something like that but uh, I just try to go with the day and you know what's surprising sometimes is you know usually we overperform my expectations I'm, I'm continuously even now after over 40 years I'm I'm still surprised at how much we get done in relation to what I think we would have so I don't know uh, and 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 then uh, contrary to that the the crew is always surprised that we get done what I say we're gonna do we're like, there's no way we're not, there's no way we're making that many queens or that many nukes, or there's no way we're going to sell 500 nukes out of those 200 colonies. That ain't going to happen. I say, don't, don't worry. It's going to happen. So they're always surprised at what happens, how much we do. And I'm always surprised uh, that we do more than I expect. So I know that probably sounds odd, but that's how we work. I, we do more than I tell them we're going to do. And we get we accomplish more than I think we can accomplish. Hmm. That probably sounds crazy. No, that that makes a lot of sense. And I I can remember, that, you know, I think the the day that we were going out, you were almost anticipating finding uh, a certain result. Um, and I, I can't remember the exact conversation that we had, but the 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 takeaway was from it. Um, and maybe you could speak to it a little bit. Is it sometimes. You know, and, and our, sometimes the, the actions that we take in the yard or for the day are sometimes um, damage control or damage assessment. We're thinking, OK, is yeah. something gone wrong? Is something going in the wrong direction? And we're kind of preparing, OK, if I go out, am I going to need feed? Am I going to need boxes? Are they going to need, you know, uh, broke back down? Are they going to need moved out? What's going on? And 
you mentioned something uh, when we were talking then is that sometimes you do worry or you are almost foreseeing there to be an issue that's actionable, but then you get out in the B yard and it's, it's fine. It's okay. It's not where you thought yeah. it were to be. You have to be flexible, I think, to be able to engage in yeah. that constant roller coaster, don't you? I guess so. Yeah. You know, Tommy, you remember Tommy that used to work for me? Yeah. He had this funny little thing. He said, man, we need a semi truck to take with us to the B yard every day because we never know what we're going to be doing or what piece of equipment we're going to need. And, you know, there's some partial truth in that. You get to the B yard and it's never exactly like you think it's going to be. So, yeah, flexible in all ways, all ways. You know, and you've been with us. You see what we do. We load the truck. We, we go prepared for a lot of potential yeah issues and part of the problem is uh, that we may not see a bee yard for three or four weeks and we're not exactly sure what's happening there when you're able to uh, visit your beehives once a week you can anticipate you know what you're going to see a little better than we're able to we get a lot of pleasant surprises and we get a lot of unpleasant surprises so happens every year there's always surprises always mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Bob, tonight we've got um, we have a few giveaways uh, for the folks that are listening. And then uh, I know Bruce and Brian are each going to have uh, a, a question for you um, throughout the night. So I thought we'll go ahead and, and take care of one of the uh, the first giveaway here at this little break. We've uh, this has been a very collaborative effort between me and Brian and Bruce um, near we're, we're almost a year um, coming up here in December. We ha we've heart we've only missed a handful of, uh, of Wednesday nights, and it's been an absolute um, honor. And just to be able to, to, to sit and chat with folks and interact, build that community, that constant you know, collaboration. Um, we've gotten to meet folks across the country, break bread. Um, Bob, I got to go on trips with you and see all the guys down in Florida. And that's an incredible opportunity to take it beyond just the the face-to-face the, the -face or the internet thing, to take it to, the, the, to actually sit down, break bread, shake someone's hand, uh, get to know them. That's, that's an incredible honor. Not everyone is able to do that. Um, but uh, tonight we have been, it's a collaborative um, kind of uh, scene kind of going on here. What we have is something pretty cool. So we thought all the folks that are um, that are, are in the comments here, um, This is the first, we have three giveaways tonight. The first one is a stream team honey sampler. So what you'll have is you'll have a, uh, a pound jar from uh, Castle Hives here in Ohio. You'll get a pound jar of uh, from Bruce's Bees. You'll get a, a pint jar from us. But here's here's the here's the big deal. You guys ready? Let me. I'm going to pull a Fred Dunn and pull something out of a off the the set here. Uh oh. He's trying to step up his game here. Is what he's trying to do. So, okay, so we've got uh, we've got a beautiful pound jar of brine. That's probably I think that was spring honey, wasn't it? Like it says, I know it's terrible to hold something. Yeah, like yeah. That, the lighter okay. colored was my spring. Okay, and then we've got uh, so that's Castle Highs. We have one from from Bruce's bees, and Bruce, that's probably your. That was probably let's see what when, when did I see you? Um, it's the it's the summer. It's the tallow honey. Summer, right? And then this is a we about the same time frame. Here's, a, here's a, uh, our, one of our pint jars here, but here is here is the cream of the crop. Are you guys ready? Now, this 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 particular pound jar is highly coveted. Um, it's uh, folks all across the country and the world. When you say um, honey, there there is one very specific um, varietal of honey that is very very sought after. Um, it can be pretty expensive, and a lot of beekeepers, um, especially maybe in the Lakemont, Georgia area go to great extremes to make sure that it's nothing but this honey um, inside of those uh, frames and in bottles so tonight on top of getting a jar from bruce brian and me you're also going to get a jar oh my of uh, the blue ridge honey company bob benny's very own sourwood wow. and so that's uh what picked that up from bob on the last trip down there so um if you're if you're interested in the honey sampler Go ahead and hit comment. Uh, what is it, Brian? What do we do? Hashtag stream team honey in the comments. Stream team honey. Okay. Yeah. So if Let you're me, interested yeah. in the honey sampler, leave us the comments below. And then Brian will cue the comments up and we'll have the little wheel of fortune and it'll select the winner. I'll be darned. What's so the keyword? That must be sourwood from last year? It would be. Yep. Okay. Yeah. yeah so it would have been. Um, 
Actually, so it's like actually it's sourwood from two the, years ago. The year before, it would have been a blue dot, a blue dot queen sourwood. <laughs> blue dot. That's one way of looking at it. Yeah, yep. we didn't make any sourwood last year, so that's, yep. that's two years old. Yep. So that's uh. Yep. Everybody, if type it, yeah, exactly how it shows on the screen there. If you want entered into the drawing, I don't know who would not want in on this drawing, but just type in, you know, hashtag stream team honey and we'll give it we'll give it a minute or two and then I'll go ahead and hit the draw. And uh, Brian, let's give them a few minutes to get um, those comments mm -hmm. in and maybe we'll have uh, Bob. There is definitely an art to making honey, but you have a certain aesthetic when you walk into your shop you're greeted by the, the 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 golden color of yellow and wood grain and warmth and then surrounding the the uh, you know just below the ceiling is pretty cool and we've we've done we've we've taken an, um, a page out of your book and have done something similar but what you have is you have folks will bring honey to the shop and you put it on display front and center mm -hmm. Yeah, it's beautiful. Could you speak to us a little bit about about the idea of that and, and what you're what you're presenting there? Well, I saw it at uh, first. I saw it at a, at a customer of mine has that on stuff like that on display. He has hundreds of bottles of honey from all over the world on a shelf. And that gave wow. me the idea to create that in our store. It's a shame it can't be down at eye level. I don't want the customers to be able to reach out and pick up the jar. Um, it's a shame it has to be, you know, up high where people can't grab it. So you can't really read the label. I'm not sure how to to uh, get past that without putting it all behind glass. Some of the honey we have is literally from around the world, Germany, Russia, India, uh, Romania, lots of countries. And I wish people could see all those labels. It's all about just adding the color and the 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 pageantry to the business, you know, Greg, you've been in here. You can, you know, we, we play a game with colors and try to make the, I use the simple term warm and fuzzy, try to make it look warm and fuzzy. And when you're having everybody else's honey on display, I think that adds to the flavor of the, the overall feeling in the place. Yeah. It's, you can't, you're just, it's just, there's just, there's such a vibe and a feel when you walk in there, you're almost overwhelmed with just how gorgeous Everything is you can smell the wood, you have the lights, there's yeah. surrounded by honey and there's candles and there's this, I mean, it's you even have your own little room where you've got yeah. the observation um, yeah. hive, but you also have art hanging on the walls. I mean, it's it's literally not just about bees. Of course, in the show, mm -hmm. there's an aesthetic and all that, but you're presenting beekeeping as an art form. And it's very easy to see as soon as you walk in. I think it's beautiful. Well, you know, uh, I. Oddly enough, I st first started to learn about how different colors affect the subconscious mind from an article written, gosh, maybe two decades ago by somebody at the National Honey Board. The Na National Honey Board actually did a, um, a research uh, a deal on the color and how it affects people. For instance, an example would, and some of these are obvious, uh, uh, red uh, gets your attention. You know, red makes you look. Uh, yellow excites the subconscious, you know, uh, something interesting about the color yellow. If you do math problems on a white uh, legal pad and do the same type of work on a yellow legal pad, you make less mistakes when you're doing it on yellow paper. They found that the colors gold, black and uh, forest green uh, give the subconscious impression of quality, even though you you're not thinking quality it, subconsciously it leads you in that direction and when you look at my label you see that i'm using christmas colors i use forest green red and a yellow background and I, I chose those although i really don't feel that my label is you know one of the best labels you'll run across it's it's pretty simple but the color is there and, and i think the label works because of the colors and I tried to incorporate that in our in our retail store, you know, all the gold uh, colors of the wood. Well, you can see the wood right behind me. That's the same color as it is in the store. And uh, then when you look in our processing room, you see we two-toned it. We have the white upper wall, of course, which uh, provides the brightness. But the lower wall is kind of a gold and yellow. So, you know, it gives. It, I did all that because of what I thought people's subconscious mind when they walked in. We use the right, I choose the light lighting colors. I try to not 
you know, there's lighting spectrum. Some create very white, bright light, which give you the ability to read something, up, you know, something small with, de with detail that you can read well. And if you go to the warmer colors, you can't see detail quite as good, but it gives you a better feeling. That color spectrum would be 4,500. I don't know what, what do they call that? 4,500? Kelvin? Yeah, I think that's the word. And that's the light. We, I chose that light for the store because I think it makes people feel better. Yeah. rather than really bright white light like you'd see in a Walmart or, or something like that. So I really thought about the place before we put it together. And, I, you know, your report helps me understand that it's working. Other people see the same thing. I'm sure. Yeah. Brian, what do you, I know you're, you've, you're, you like colors and you're into seeing the different uh, things that are going on and you're always fooling with lights and cameras <clears throat> Uh, and things like that. What do you think about that as far as colors and light? How, do, how does that play into what we do? That is like very interesting. And I just changed my light to 4,500. <laughs> so okay, yeah. if I look better and I excite you, that's <laughs> why. <laughs> well, it looks good. I that, mean, is, that is interesting. I, I would have never thought about that, but I mean, yeah, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, you know, you can go as high as six thousand. That's just that's just really white, and you lose all that warm, fuzzy feeling under light like that. You really do. Yeah, and it's interesting, interesting how so many beekeepers are also in tune with with the art of, um, you know, all those things. Literally, just before we got on, I put the light on back over here and put it on thirty two hundred, and oh, yeah. it went as low as it could go, and. You just kind of um, roll with it. But uh, I want to get some questions from Brian and Bruce as we kind of uh, go down this 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 route of the art of beekeeping. Brian, yeah, what, what question do you have for Bob? Well, before we get to the question, I'm going to I'm going to throw in one little item and, and it could almost be used as like a honey coaster. You know, when you get your your stream team honey, uh, you know, package in the mail. Check out this right here. What do you got there? Wow, look at you've been busy. Uh -huh. Now my brother my brother made these, but yeah, it's a good little coaster. Cool. So I guess you can uh, bring that I'll, down Saturday when you come down for the learning yard. Saturday when I when I stop down, yeah, I'll, I'll bring it. So I'll bring well, it. Brian, why don't you well, go ahead and spin the honey wheel and then we'll follow up with a question from you for Bob. Okay. Well, well, there we go. 129 on here now. Hmm. Let's see who it is. Okay, the winner of the honey sampler. Let's see. Oh, Tim, Tim Hoffman. Hoffman. That's great. Tim's down in Florida, so he's he has a first hand experience with uh with Ian. I enjoy watching his posts. He's uh you know growing the bee yard and getting into uh rearing queens and uh growing all that so tim congratulations i'll get that shipped wow. out to you that's awesome uh, it probably will be, it'll be next week once i get the coaster from brian we'll get that um we get that shipped out we've got two more giveaways coming up here so definitely stay tuned um i'll, I'll give you a hint on the the grand prize at the very end is um bob when i was down working with you guys and we collected all those blue dot queens i also brought back a bunch of queen cells and a bunch of singles and we really got busy isolating those genetics and saturating all of our queen yards with that more of that newer world carny Caucasian influence. And I noticed something that I thought we had a good line as is, you know, it's after all these years of you know breeding from the best, the ones that were surviving us, when we blended the genetics that you had in your yard with ours, they just changed. Uh, and they, 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 they took a, a turn. I wasn't quite, um, expecting so fast and they keep doing that and it's incredible it's a good change mm -hmm. where we're, we're constantly seeing so what i what i refer to it is is you know i have taken bob's southern appalachian queens with our northern appalachian queens and we've blended those two together for an appalachian mutt and they probably do something similar than what that as what yours do but they kind of they they tone down um going into the winter time um they kind of they, they brood down at their own rate and then they will about scare the tar right out of you because in February and March, when we're mm -hmm. in peeking in on them, you look down and you might see three to five frames of bees and you're thinking, oh, my God, there's no way that colony is going to amount to anything. 
And then just when you're about ready to just freak out on them and you crack open that lid for that last check, that whole single's full. And then you add a box and they catch up and they just have this ability to they 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 they're they are in tune with nature it seems a little better um, than some of the other varieties that we've had or strains in the past where they don't fool around making too much brood too soon they almost just pause until everything's right and they pulse and they might grow a little and little and all of a sudden it seems like when the flora and the fauna and the temps are just right then she goes and then she just goes and goes and goes and goes and actually outpaces uh, even more of a straight Italian um, type of a colony. And it's actually been a beautiful trait um, to have, especially up north here, because they seem to get by on a whole lot less. They're a lot more frugal, it seems, with the resources and also the bees they're making on the incoming. And that has been a big deal um, for northern beekeeping. So um, the, tonight's the, the grand prize giveaway um, is we're going to give a, a spring nuke um, from our stock that will have the, that same, it'll have an Appalachian mutt queen. So you'll have uh, the, the stuff that we brought from Bob and we blended it with ours. That'll be in one of those nukes. So stay tuned here uh, later on tonight. Wow. That'll be our grand prize. Um, That's a nice uh, gift. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Brian, what, what question do you have for Bob? I tell you, so Bob, looking at your years of beekeeping, if there is one like moment, one memory that stands out, what is that? What is that memory? What's that moment? I, I do have something that stands out. It, it and I, I'm not doing this on purpose, but it, it goes back to my very first year of beekeeping. Uh, Greg, I think you've heard me talk about the old man that kind of got me started, Delmer. Delmer. I don't know if I ever told you about him or not. Oh, yeah. He was, uh, he was an interesting man. He was uh, very soft-spoken, didn't have much to say, didn't have any sense of humor at all. I never saw him laugh at anything, but it didn't mean he was a rude person. He was a nice, nice person and generous to a fault, but he was so focused and everything was about business and uh, <clears throat> that year, I, I started 1981 by buying eight colonies of bees, and I got to know Delmer really well because he was a retired commercial beekeeper in the area, and he was selling bee supplies. <clears throat> and uh, over the summer, I got to know him really good, and he was, uh, he, he, at one point, he said, I can see you're very serious about this. And you know, I told him I wanted to be a commercial beekeeper, and in the fall, he said, I can see you're very serious about this. And I, he says, I want to show you something. And we got in his old, I guess it was about a 1970 Pontiac wagon, uh, had the shocks blown out of it. He'd been using it like a pickup truck. And he <laughs> took me to a bee yard. And there were 75 colonies there that were in total disarray. He had, he almost had gotten crippled. He, he walked with a cane and a walker and not shortly after that, he really had to start using a wheelchair. But we got into this bee yard, and he hadn't seen these 75 colonies in almost a year. And they, some of them were dead. Uh, this was pre-mites, you know, keep that in mind. Uh, some of them were very small. Some looked kind of sick, and some needed a new queen, and some were robust. And he says, I'd like to sell you these colonies. And we And I had no money. I had nothing. I was broke. And uh, I said, I, I'd love to buy them from you. I can't afford the colonies. And he said, well, that's all right. I'll, I'll let you pay me back in honey and beeswax. And, and then it was obvious that many of them needed feed. And he said, well, I'll buy the feed. Don't worry about that. And he just took it upon himself to take me under his wing and make, make darn sure that I was going to be successful. He did everything it took to put me on the path. And I'll never forget that. And uh, by the time we were out of that yard, I was doing the work. He would say, pop that lid. Mm -hmm. you know, let's look at that one. Check that one for a good queen or a bad queen. And he was sitting on top of a colony. And after about two hours and we'd gotten through, I had gotten through those 75 colonies. And uh, I was walking to the car and he did something really odd. He, and I, and I teach my crew the same thing. It's very important. Um, we got to the car and he turned around and looked at the bee yard and I said, what are you looking for? And he said, he said, always look back one more time, no matter what you think. He said, 
always turn around and look back at the bee yard one more time. So that was an interesting lesson. But in that mm -hmm. moment, it almost was like an intuitive light bulb aha moment. I, I, I felt I didn't feel I knew in that moment I was standing in the presence of a true master beekeeper. Mm -hmm. Like we talked mm -hmm. about early, mm -hmm. earlier, this man was a master beekeeper. And I, I saw it in that that was probably the last time he ever went to a bee yard in his life because he died wow. you know, too long after that. And I, it almost makes me want to have a tear in my eye thinking about that moment, looking at him, looking back and just watching him. And I just felt, man, this, this guy is a true master beekeeper. And the last thing he wants to do on this planet is to make sure I'm successful. Wow. So it was a very touching moment in that bee yard. Mm -hmm. Just kind of that aha moment, it really kind of a, I don't know how to describe my feeling, really. It was just tremendous. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Bob, did you, wow. in, in that moment, I know it's, you know, if you, you have the memory of it. Um, when you felt like Delmer was putting you on the path, did you feel as though doors were opening then? Well, yeah, they'd been opening all summer, and that was just the, the – that was that really was the huge door of that season. Well, there was another one. About a month later, he asked me to come on over to his place, and he said, "So, another interesting lesson, very simple but very profound." He said, "If you're going to be a commercial beekeeper, you need to work for a commercial beekeeper for a while." And he didn't even ask me if I wanted to do it. He just got on the phone and dialed, dial, you know, dialed the phone, and I could hear his end of the conversation. He said, "Yeah." He said, you still need looking for help, some help? And I didn't hear the other end of the conversation. He said, okay, I'm sending somebody over. And he hung up the phone. He said, here's the address. Go meet this man. And that was the other oh, one wow. of the other neat things he did for me. So another huge door in that. That first season was just tremendous. It was just door after door after door. And that was the last big one. That was in November of 1981. And Delmer, that first year, he opened all those doors for me. And he told me what I had to do. You know, I don't have you heard this story, Greg? First time I met him, I, I bought those eight colonies and the guy told me, oh, everything you need here, you can split bees here, you can grow. Everything you need is right in these eight triple deeps. Well, when I got them opened up, complete novice, had never opened a beehive before. They were absolutely full of queen cells. Every one oh, of them. Nice. Some of them had already swarmed. Some of them were going to swarm, and I'd read enough books to where I realized that I actually had something valuable there if I could just figure out how to use it. And so the, the man that sold me the bees had told me about Delmer selling supplies, and I went over to Delmer's place, which was about 45 minutes away, and walked in, had my Volkswagen van and a couple hundred bucks, which back then was a lot of money. And I gave him my list of stuff, and he said, what are you trying to do? And I told him exactly what I was in the middle of. And he said, he didn't even answer. He just said, okay, nodded his head. And then as I, as I stood in his shop, he started wandering around and taking stuff off the shelf. After about 10 minutes, he had a mountain of equipment in the middle of the floor. And I was watching this going, okay, I, I can't afford this. this so I stopped him at some point. He said, I think this is what you need. And I said, well, let, let's just hold on right here now. Wait a minute. I said, I can't afford this. I said, this is way more equipment than I can afford. And he says, well, this is what you need to do what you need to do right now. And I said, uh, uh, sir, I didn't know him from Adam. He didn't know me. We'd never met each other. I said, sir, I, I can't afford this. This is way too much. And he thought for a moment, keep now I'm going to say it again. We'd never met each other. And then his next line was, well, you can just pay me back in honey and wax. Oh, man. I, I, this gave me true pause. I, I turned around and stood looking out the window probably for five or ten seconds thinking, what, what's wrong here? You know, this isn't this is this doesn't make sense. And I just got a, a nice warm feeling. I felt like it was all good. And I turned around and I said, OK. And he didn't even ask for my phone number. I'm not even sure I'd even told him my name. And he said, just, uh, you know, get back with me. Let me know how wow. things are going. So. I did all this work with all this equipment. I made 35 splits with all these queen cells. And it, it turned out that I had 32 takes after all this. And after the queens had hatched and made it, I went back to him and told him what had happened. And he, 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 uh, he just, he loved that. He just felt so good that 
we'd had this little success between the two of us. And he said, okay, now you're going to need, now you're going to need this, 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 and this. And I said, wait, you know, I said, well, you know, I don't have any money. He says, it's okay. It's okay. You can pay me back in honey and wax, which is exactly what I did. At one point I owed him $5,000, which 1981, you know, that's a lot of money. And he still, I mean, we just, we met each other that, that summer. He didn't know me. Anyway, wow. that went on for about five years, and he's the one that got me really into the business. The next year, he did something even better. I showed up to his place one time in uh, late June or mid-June, and he sold a lot of equipment, and they would spend the winter, him and this kid that he hired, they'd nail frames and put together boxes. And I showed up in June after the spring honey flow was over, and I this was only my second year there, and I was unfamiliar with a plant called yellows star thistle that grows in southern oregon and northern california and he was he had a mountain of, of medium boxes and frames with foundation that they had in his garage i said what are you going to do with all this stuff he says well you're going to need it and i said no i'm wrong man I, I said wait a minute now i said i already am really uncomfortable with how much money i owe you and he said something that took me a minute to figure out he said there's nobody else i'd rather have owe me money than you and he said it in such a dry fashion that I didn't know what to think about it. And it took me about five minutes to realize he just gave me what from Delmer was the ultimate uh, compliment. And he was right that we, we got a thunderstorm just ahead of the yellow star thistle, which almost never happens in southern Oregon at that time of year. And he said, we're going to have the best yellow star thistle here that we've had in a long time. And you're going to need these supers. <clears throat> and that spring, I went from 75 colonies. Well, I went from about 100. Let me back up. I went from about 80 because I lost some of those colonies going into winter. I went from 80 to 175, okay. made a bunch of nukes and stuff like that. And I averaged 175 pounds around on that yellow star thistle. And everybody, even the old timer said, we've never seen a crop like this before. But Del wow. here was coming and he set me up with the equipment to do it. And that, that catapulted me into the next year going to 300 and the next year going to 500. Everything he did provided the steps for me to make the next level. And he, he always was ahead of me. You know, he always said, well, you need this. And I'm saying, like, I don't want to. I don't want to buy it from you. I can't afford it. He says, well, you've got to have it. And he just kept providing these steps for me. And uh, so that's kind of part of the story, too. Wow. That's a that's a big deal, Bob, because um, the the Bob Benny that I know is is known for the the the, the statement that there um, there's plenty of room at the table for really? everybody. Yeah. Um, and I, I know um, you have opened up a lot of doors um, for us uh, and showed me a lot of things, brought me uh, connected me to, to ideas and thoughts and ways of beekeeping that you have done graciously and humbly. And I think if you look back into your history and in time, Mr. Delmer did the same thing for you too. He was yeah. that lighthouse to you. He, he had enough intuition and was in tune with the art of not only beekeeping, but growth. He was in, he was maybe a, a master of the art of, of communication and knowing or being in tune. I, I almost, I'm sitting here wondering, man, you know, I wish I knew more about Delmer's story. Cause I bet there was also someone that was a lighthouse to him that set him on a path that opened up doors for him and it's been a continual thing just one person one beekeeper after the next and that's a beautiful thing if you really think about that yeah well there may have been somebody i don't know he was born in 1911 and he worked uh, uh, as a kid on the family farm in southern oregon he was giving the task of taking care of the beehives on the farm when he was really young like wow. he said he started when he was eight by the time he was 11 or 12, it was his job to take care of the couple dozen wow. colonies on the farm. And he, he told me something funny. He said by the 30s, he was wide open. And he said he made his biggest honey crop in 1939. And this, this is funny. He said, I put it. He said, me and my helper loaded it into a car and sent it to Los Angeles for four cents a pound. And I thought, <laughs> well, that's not that much honey if he loaded it into a car. And he said, a train car. <laughs> wow. And back then they put honey, he called it tins. He said, we sent a trailer load of a car load of tins to Los Angeles. And 
tins were what they was a term they used for a five gallon square tin can mm. and they were using those in the 30s for uh for you know hauling honey in quantity wow. they're, they're really they weren't using drums yet most beekeepers were using five gallon square tins in those days and uh, he, he said he was tickled pink at four dollars a pound and i guess in the late depression that would have been something you know would have been a lot of money Anyway, yeah. he got around to running 2,000 colonies with one helper there in the Rogue oh, Valley God. in southern Oregon. Wow. Yeah. Jeez. Well, I, I, guess, I guess we all owe a hat tip uh, to Delmer, too. Delmer put go, you yeah. on a path and yeah. uh, opened up doors, and uh, you've done that for, for so many of us, too. Bruce, yeah. I, I know you're, you're also a, a student of, uh, of beekeeping and have a, a, an appreciation for those that have came before um to help set us down the path we're all on the shoulders of giants it seems as we um there's the, the old proverb is there's nothing new under the sun um but it, it it is something neat to spend a little bit of time thinking about you know those ones that have came before that have set us on the path that have helped open the doors gave us the tools that we need with no strings attached um that's that's an incredible um kind of a, of a way to live life bruce i know uh, you've been busy down there, you know, growing your operation and uh, raising honey. I know you got to have a question for Bob. Well, I, <clears throat> excuse me, Mike. Sorry, let me get something. <clears throat> put Bruce I'm on the spot here. Sorry, lot. Bruce. <laughs> no, I, I knew it was coming. I just needed to clear my throat a little bit. But um, as we've been talking, my question keeps changing. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I had some nuts and bolts questions about you know, treating for mites and honey production and things like that. But I think, uh, I think I'm going to wax a little more philosophical uh, on my initial question. Anyway, I think that's kind of what we're looking for tonight. Anyway, um, kind of, you know, you've told an incredible story and that's, I think most of us out there that are successful have some sort of a similar story. Uh, we've all had a mentor or mentors that have helped us. Some have succeeded, <clears throat> excuse me, some have succeeded by reading books and getting in the bees and trying to figure out some have kind of done it on their own, but most people have been surrounded by or known people that have really helped them. I had uh, my first um, mentor, the guy that got me set up in bees was very much like that. You know, I did pay him for the products for the bees and for the equipment, and, but he was always there to lend a hand to me. And um, he, if I didn't pay him, he didn't care, but I, I always just did, but he was just a great help. And he's, He's kind of on the verge of getting out of the bee business, I think, in the next few years. But I've got a couple of young guys, actually, now that are really great mentors, more on, on the commercial type, a large sideliner side right now that have taught me a lot. Um, but I think fast forward a little bit, if you could. I know you mentioned um, your mentor and, and the, the people who helped you get going. Um, as you've grown your business and your operation over the years, obviously, you mentioned that you knew from day one that there was a tremendous business opportunity there. Uh, that was kind of your focus from day one. I think a lot of people start off just intrigued by bees and want to try it. And, and some want to stay small, some want to grow and all kinds of different goals. But have you always kind of going to kind of a two part question, three part question here. Obviously, you had the great mentor and the people that kind of helped you along the way. As you've matured in your beekeeping business and operation, um, Obviously, now you have the heart of a teacher. You know, you're out here doing these videos. You're participating in things like this. And um, have you always had that great desire to share and to help other people? And Or has it grown stronger as you've become more mature and your business has grown? And uh, kind of what got you into the teaching on a larger scale via YouTube and things like that? What kind of motivated you to do that um, over the years? Kind of how has your desire to teach and share mentor, your mentorship uh, desire, how has that grown over the years? And develop well the answer is going to surprise you i've never had a desire to teach anybody anything <laughs> um, one day i was uh, asked to speak at a uh, small packers honey packer symposium at medina ohio kim flottam asked me to come up oh wow huh, huh? No, I, I was just saying oh wow i i know i know of uh kim yeah so he was the editor of bee culture at that time and uh, he was looking for people that were medium, small packers to come up and join the symposium and, you know, talk about what they knew. And Jennifer Berry, who I'm guessing you all know who she is, she said, well, Kim, you need to call Bob because he's doing what you're trying to tell people. And I agreed to go. 
and he was it was a nice meeting and Kim was very gracious and on the last evening he took all the speakers out to dinner to a Chinese restaurant don't know why I remember that part but I we were sitting across the table from each other and having a nice conversation and we got to talking about his magazine and I was I tried to be just as diplomatic and nice as I could but I was being a little bit critical and I said you know the something that's lacking in your magazine is that there's not enough real beekeepers, successful beekeepers telling other people how to do it. And he, he didn't take offense. I didn't mean offense. And he thought about it for a few seconds. And then he, he leaned across the table and got pretty close to my face and said, the problem is the people that are doing it just don't talk about how they're doing it. And what he was doing was personally challenging me. And I, when I went to the motel room that night, I understood that. And I suddenly had kind of a, you know, another one of those aha moments. And I thought, well, what a hypocrite I am. I'm criticizing mm -hmm. him for what's lacking in his magazine. And it's people like me that won't step up <clears throat> and, you know, share where we've been and what we think we know. And I just got this fe bad feeling about myself of being a hypocrite. And I decided that I would write a couple, I would write articles. That's what, that was my decision. I decided I would write some articles for Kim and I did. And I only wrote four or five and two or three of them turned out real good. And then one day, uh, some guy that was working for me came into the office and said, you know, there's this guy in Canada, Ian Stepler is who he was talking about. So there's this guy in Canada that's feeding bees the exact same way we do. You should look at his videos. I had never in my life looked at one YouTube video ever. I, I, I'm, at that point, I was really good at sending emails. I was just totally great. You, you know this about me. I'm oh, yeah. not that person. And I watched that video and I thought to myself, well, I think I could do that. And that sent me on the path of making YouTube videos instead of writing articles. And it's been uh, totally, what's happened is totally unexpected. I did not expect to be looked at as somebody that, the expert, you know, or somebody that's the teacher. That was not where I was heading. It's not what I was trying to accomplish. I was just trying to be a nice person and not be a hypocrite and, you know, to kind of do my, my moral duty of helping other people a little bit. And it just catapulted me on this path of now it for, took me six months to put out three or four videos and they were semi successful. So I learned about SEO uh, site. What do they call it? What's SEO stand for? Greg? Search um, engine optimization. Yeah. So I, I kind of taught me that looked at some YouTube videos. <laughs> okay. So I need to do this and this and yeah. this to help get my videos seen. And, uh, uh, bought a little app called uh, TubeBuddy, which helps mm -hmm. with the right names and words. And so I got kind of a handle on that. And suddenly the view, suddenly I was at a thousand subscribers. And then from there, it just went kaboom. Yeah. And now it's going so fast. I'm just astounded. Um, did not expect it. Still a little bit overwhelming. I'm learning how to be gracious when people tell me how good I am or how yeah. special I am because I don't feel that at all. And at first, you know, I would answer compliments like that with self something self-deprecating. You know, it was just right. I'm kind of a timid person at, at my core. And, and now I'm learning to be very gracious and appropriate and, and accept that and accept this role of being somebody that is a teacher. So I'm kind of learning how to step into that concept, but that's not how it started out. Well, Bob, I <clears throat> kind of a follow up to that. Um, I'm going to think it's, I think it was probably about two years ago, maybe three. I, uh, I talked to Cayman one day on the phone and, and he talked about the tremendous frustration with a lot of people out here. I would include myself in this and maybe him when he was smaller of the fact that the commercial guys didn't share, you know, what they're doing. Obviously you commercial guys and, and those who put food on the table, uh, with their bees have to keep their bees alive and be successful and learn the business ends of it the best ways to to be profitable as well as just to keep the bugs alive you got to be able to do that in order to be successful beekeepers and so what i think we have was a lot of you know hobby beekeepers um out here which hobby beekeepers are awesome but a lot of people with maybe not a lot of experience 
uh, I don't know if the word is posing or, or teaching uh, principles and expecting success, you know, from people all over the country. And I think it's important to kind of, there's a breakthrough happening right now, I think, and this is kind of Cayman's whole hive life, I would call it movement is to allow everyday beekeepers to get a glimpse into what is successful. I think that's one reason your channel and Ian's channel and, and people who are legitimate commercial beekeepers who are sharing this content. I think that's one reason that your channels are growing so fast and so successfully is because you're giving the small scale guys, the brand new beekeepers a peek into what really works and what it's really like uh, to be a successful beekeeper. And uh, obviously there are, there are many uh, successful uh, beekeepers out there at all levels, whether they have two colonies or 10,000 colonies. Um, and it's good for everyone to share, but I think that's what people really like. I like watching your videos. I remember the first one I saw of you was one of your uh, videos on feeding um, bees. And or it may have been the one where you talked about honey. You were doing like a, um, a presentation, I think, at a, at a bee club or something or, or at somewhere. And you talked about honey and how it breaks down over years. I remember one of the comments oh, yeah. in there was you talked about how you know, they say that the honey is good for thousands of years in the, in the pyramid. And you said, I wouldn't want, I wouldn't want to eat that honey or something like that. But you, you talked about the principles of how the honey kind of breaks down the enzymes. Yeah. It's just a really good scientific breakdown of honey. And also you've done several great videos on feeding and just everything you do. You just allow people to have a peek into number one, what you're doing. And number two, just the science behind beekeeping. And I think that's extremely valuable for us out here trying to figure some things out and, and uh, I just, I recently saw your video. I was very intrigued by it. It was actually one of my favorite videos that I've watched of yours where you just took a tour of the of your business. You walked through and you met the people and you talked about the, the honey tasting and you talked about your facility. And that was just really neat to see that. And, and um, you, I remember at the beginning of the video, I think you said, I, I really am not sure what to film today. So let's just go walk oh, around and, and yeah. shoot the video. And that that's the kind of stuff that I, I just really enjoyed that. And so, yeah, that was recent. It was a Friday and I thought it, it was, yeah, I got nothing. <laughs> let's go take <clears throat> some candid camera. But, you know, Bruce, your channel is uh, filling kind of a niche, too. I see people comment about, you know, like you're showing them your journey. Mm -hmm. would you look at it like that I, I think so I, I'm yeah. still still trying to figure out what I want to do when I grow up and that's my problem I think so well, people I, seem to be uh, hooking into that they like watching your journey your your process of how you're doing how you're growing and learning and so you you're kind of, you got a following there too well my my goal would be to be like you but <laughs> I started a lot later. It'd be very tough to, to grow that big. And I do work full time. And so I, I'm very firmly in the sideliner camp uh, for me to be true commercial quote unquote would be very difficult, but, but I dabble in a little bit of, um, you know, I, I send a few bees out to California, very few. And I, I, you know, have a fair honey crop every year and I'm doing a little bit of everything. I just haven't really gotten into the queen production, but everything else mostly I've done a little bit of. And so I can kind of, and I've, I've learned through a lot of mistakes. I've done a lot of things wrong. And I try to kind of share that. If I don't show it, I talk about it. And many times I'll show it if I, if I mess up. And so, yeah, you're being um, honest. but I'm getting, you know, it's getting a little better. I think I'm, I'm, I'm not a very good record keeper. I'm not very good at documenting everything I do, um, writing it down on a paper, this hive here and this hive there. And I forget sometimes, and I'm just kind of all over the place. I'm not nearly as organized as, all three of you guys are. Um, but I just, I just, every year I kind of, I think I kind of, I what? think I kind of pinpoint a little you better. Organized? <laughs> every year wow. I kind of pinpoint a little better and I kind of know what to recognize. And, and I think Bobby made a great point earlier. You just have to crack open the hives and get in there. You yeah. just can't read books and you can't watch videos and you can't just think you have it figured out just by watching and, and reading. You have to get in there and read the bees, so to speak, let them teach you. Um, and I'm going to kind of real quick, Greg, a uh, little shout out to Greg's Queens. Um, I recently got some Queens from Greg and I, I've, I've had really nice bees before I watch your videos, Bob, your bees look pretty nice, um, uh, for the most part and Brian and, but, but these Queens I got from Greg, I spent a long time since I've really cracked open a hive and they have been as calm as that. And you can hear them walking on the frames almost. It's just a beautiful thing. 
and just the rhythmic, the almost like a, it's very therapeutic to me. You know, a lot of my bees are quite feisty much of the year, but, but it's been just really neat to, to crack open those, those colonies with the Queens from Greg and, and um, just to see that, you know, working really hard. They're not lazy bees. They're moving around the frames, but it's just a rhythmic, just a motion and a, it's just kind of neat to see. And I, I just love that. I'll, I'll get discouraged and depressed and I just open up a colony and it's just, uh, I just love it. And so um, I appreciate that. With a comment like that, Greg, you better up your numbers next year because you, you, he just sold some queens for you. A bunch of them, probably. Yeah. Well, I you know, I, I tell you, I, I, we, I can't take, you know, taking the credit for anything is just not, not my speed, but you know, I, I keep going back to, uh, Delmer setting you on a path, you know, you helped set me on a path and really rearranged a lot of my thinking, um, and have a, you have a, a long lasting impact that I don't think you'll ever fully, um, recognize, but you, you talked about Demer giving you those tools, um, that set you down that path. Um, you know, getting into some of those blue dot genetics, um, and that had already overwintered for you had already proven their salt, bringing those back, introducing those to ours, those cells, all those drones, getting that, that high saturation of those genetics. I mean, it just, there's just something, you know, a lot of folks are listening. They're, they're never going to get the opportunity to crack a lid with Bob. But when you crack those lids, even on a four-way pallet and doubles, and you pull a frame out, those bees just have this thing where they, they're just like, it's like, it's like a smooth river. They're just kind of going across the frame. They're just kind of doing their thing. They're not skittery, running all over the top of the place. They're not you know, just staying, they just have this really chilled out vibe to the frame um, that is an amazing feature to have when you're getting in there and you're opening up so many bees at once to have them to almost seem cool and collected was a big thing. The joke is, Bob, that Bruce has these Alabama, Alabama's eye. What do you, what do you, what do you say? Alabama, 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 Alabama eyes. I can't say it I right. Spice girls. They were, they just were a little spicy. And so um, we were coming down to visit some of the beekeepers. You saw the, the intro video. We, we went on a little tour and, and met some beekeepers and kind of got to know them. Well, the joke was I was going to bring some of these queens down uh, for Bruce. So as a joke, as I'm pulling them, I'm taking the video of pulling the queens. Um, I had a pink marker. And so I marked them all Pepto pink to help cool down and all those spicy um, bees. And I've been enjoying Bruce's videos. He's been sharing little updates of where they are. They seem to be. Um, kind of smoothing out and he's for the first I'm, I'm watching bruce work his bees with no gloves on which is kind of a big deal um there, there's a we got a lot of questions um bob but um i wonder if you could talk a little bit about the art of the queen there seems to be a certain synergy um an essence a dynamic that happens um that i don't know that we fully know as if we introduce a queen how does that necessarily it doesn't always make the same impact if you like sometimes you can introduce a queen and it's an immediate thing and the, and the hive cools off sometimes it might take a few rounds of brood what do you think is going on there that that is causing the vibe to change so quick with introducing a new queen um, and why does it take a little bit longer sometimes for that brood to kind of reorganize to show those traits well, you went a little bit above my head there. I'm not sure I have a good answer. The latter part is obvious. I mean, after a couple of rounds of broods, you re you replace all the bees in the colony and, you know, the feistiness can then be gone. As far as why a colony would settle down almost immediately, I really don't have an answer for that. I don't know. I mean, we could make a lot of theories and, you know, something about pheromones or something like that. I'm afraid I don't have a good answer for that one. You know, uh, I didn't do anything special to those queens. I just bought, you know, artificially inseminated breeder queens from Sue Kobe. That's all there was to it. You know, six or eight years ago, I had feisty bees too. I mean, we sometimes, I have a friend who put it perfectly, sometimes we'd come out of the bee yard feeling like we went two rounds with Mike Tyson, you know. <laughs> but, but in one year, I just said, I've had enough of this blankety blank you know yeah. <laughs> and uh, started buying uh at first i bought uh carniolan breeder queens from sue i you know i had carniolans from uh the new, new world carniolan line that i queens that i bought from other queen producers and i liked them i remembered liking them and then i'd had caucasians from the past too but at that time caucasian wasn't available from her 
And when we started getting into Carniolan, sure enough, the bees started to settle down. And those really feisty bees were fine on a good day with a good honey flow. But the moment it got overcast and things weren't great, you know, they, they just pepper you. And I started to lose that problem. And then when we started to get into the Caucasian about, I guess that'd be about three years ago, that really had an effect. I mean, our bees calmed way down when we started pushing the Caucasian in there. And I still have to buy queens from a, a person or two whom you know, Greg, that, mm -hmm. you know, to make nukes and packages in the spring. And their bees are what would be considered average. They're not mean bees. But when we were, sometimes I have to use their queens in my outfit too, because, you know, for one reason or another, maybe we have nukes left over from making nukes for sale. And we'll work that yard, which is average in my view, and then we'll step into a yard that has this Caucasian carniolan thing going on. And everybody, everybody on the crew just takes a breath and says, what a difference. You know, it's just, mm. you can just feel it in the air we settle down, we feel better, we feel more at ease, you know, uh, because we're less anxious about, you know, getting stung, trying to be super careful not yeah. to get stung. And it really comes down to those darker bees we're running, the Caucasians and Carniolans. So we're not doing anything special. It's just the breeder queens we buy. Yeah. Bob, a quick follow-up question. If, you know, just for people watching this video, um, if they do have the spicy queens, like I still have some, mine, I have one just Monday that I've got one left in one of my bee yards that even though we've got a fall flow coming in, it's just, it's a very productive colony. Just as yeah. I, it's just, but man, they are just, they lit me up. They were just after me. The rest of the colonies in that particular bee yard weren't too bad for the most part, <laughs> but um, what would be your recommendation for someone maybe on a, a hobby to a sideliner level or, or any level really? If yeah. they want to take a if they want to take an overall average of, you know, medium to spicy bees and just tone that down without having to replace every queen in the in the bee yard, what would be your strategy to do that? Well, uh, what would you recommend? Right off the bat, a brand new beekeeper <clears throat> or a small beekeeper that's not seasoned and experienced at finding queens is going to be intimidated by trying to requeen a colony like that. And there's a, there's a trick that works beautifully. If you've got more than one colony, just pick that colony up in the middle of the day and move it to the other side of the yard. And tomorrow, there will be no field force in that colony. The field force are the mean bees. They're the ones that do most of the stinging. If you can lose the field force, suddenly you can actually work that colony and find the queen without getting plastered with stings. Mm -hmm. And you don't have forever. I mean, it's going to generate a field force in short order, but... The next day, you should be able to work that colony. And, of course, most of us know about tricks about, you know, putting a queen excluder in between boxes. So, you know, four days later, whichever box has eggs, that's where the queen is. So you can you can do the move the colony trick. You can do the queen excluder trick to where at least you zero her down to what box she's in. And, you know, there's tricks you can pull to try to make it easier to find the queen and uh, requeening absolutely first thing just lose it's either that or a cup of gasoline in the top <laughs> <laughs> um, just move absolutely. them lose the field force and not only okay. is losing the field force make the colony easier to work it makes your queen acceptance way better too because it's the older bees that don't want to accept a new queen so that's mm -hmm. what i would recommend to new beekeepers move the colony lose the field force and then you can actually get the job done Okay, and that field force, I guess, will go into other colonies. Right, and if you don't have uh, any other colonies, now you got a different problem. <laughs> uh, maybe you can move it to the other side of your yard and leave an empty box there with a couple of combs in it, and just just lose the field force. Just to forgive yeah. me, it sounds kind of kind of bad about just letting those bees go to bee heaven, but uh, if you can lose uh, those field force bees, you're you're going to have a lot better luck. That is that is a wise that is great that's a great answer and I've never really thought of doing it that way but but and that's because boy trying to trying to wade through a colony that's just got sixty thousand seventy thousand bees in it that are just mad. Well, that in your no case, fun. let's use your uh, outfit as an example. You have four way <clears throat> pallets, right? I've got my, yeah, I've got a little bit of both, but yeah, my, yeah. okay. Yeah. Just pick the colony up, move it ten feet. The bees will go back to the other three colonies on the pallet. Now you can work that colony. And after it gets, you know, set it on anything, some scrap bottom mm -hmm. board, whatever. 
then after the queen's accepted, you can just uh, every few days move it two feet and move it back to the pallet again. Yeah, or even or even you could just move it back and with the realization that you know the field force bees that are in that one will now go into their colonies and will be fine. So or or if, if <clears throat> the spot you're moving it back to is their only choice. <laughs> I mean, yeah, if not another pallet closer. They'll go. They'll find their corner. You know. Sure, they'll figure it out. They. Mm-hmm. That, that's one thing I remember. Um, uh, when I first started thinking about doing a little bit of palletizing my bees, I had I think nine or ten nukes sitting up at the farm, and and they I I'd introduced queens in them, and they were doing really well. Just bees everywhere. Um, they were across from my production hives up at the farm, and one day about it wasn't the best time of the day to do it, but but I had to kind of just get it done. So I went up there and my idea was to use those nukes that I created. They were early spring nukes as some of my start, you know, my, my palletized bees to send off to pollination that first year. And I went up to the farm, I loaded them up in my truck and I drove away 10 o'clock in the morning. Field force was out, you know, doing their thing. And, and I remember looking back over my, you know, looking at it and there were bees, a cloud of bees, no place to go no place yeah. to go at all just from these field force was out there and it was spring so there was a you know it was probably in april or may i think actually and it's bees everywhere and i just left and i came back you know a, a couple hours later when, and they were all no bees flying around they had just found other colonies to go into and there were really no other colonies right there they were kind of across the road probably 30 or 40 feet away but but they found some place to go yeah so people there's a misconception i think people have that bees will go back and they'll hang out on that on that landing for the beat where the hive was and just sit there and die, but they'll usually find a place to go. It seems yeah, like there, to me anyway. Yeah. If there's another beehive in the vicinity, they absolutely will figure it out. <clears throat> awesome stuff. That's a great, I'm going to have to do that when I try to requeen the other, the other problem I have, Bob is, is actually finding the queen. Um, I know, I noticed when you're out there with your crew, many times I see you, uh, you, a couple of you confirm that the queen either is or is not on a frame. Yeah. Um, so what do you have any tips or tricks? And I, I know, I know Greg, we're looking at philosophical stuff here, but do you have any tips or tricks to finding a queen, uh, in a, in a packed out beehive? You've already talked about a couple, but is there anything, uh, well, different tricks? you know, when we do that, when I look at a frame and I don't think the queen's there and then I hand it to somebody else on the crew and let them look at it, you know, we still miss a couple. I mean, somehow you don't get them all. And it's, it's like a quantity over quality game. I mean, sometimes we just miss a couple and, and I just, I know that and I accept that risk. It's a little bit of a crapshoot and we just do it. If you absolutely find the queen every single time, it just takes so much time. And so you have to weigh the benefits, the pros and cons, you know, how much did it cost? Of course, I'm always looking at it from a money point of view. How much does it cost me to make darn sure I find that queen? Versus how much does it cost me if I have a few nukes that end up with the old queen and a few colonies that end up queenless and have to rear a new queen. And uh, it, it kind of, it, it really falls on the side of just not absolutely finding the queen. It's cheaper to do it that way. You know, a lot of beekeepers, big guys I know, they make zero effort to find a queen. They just split colonies to pieces and let the tips fall. And uh, they'll figure out where the old queen is later. It's obvious, you know. And then yeah. they'll kill her or let her go if she's doing a good job. And they don't even worry about it. So sometimes I wonder if I'm being less efficient at trying to be so careful about getting all my colonies requeened every year. That's costly. Not just the yeah. cost of the queen, but in the labor. It's, it's, I'm probably, mm-hmm. if I was somehow magically able to pencil all that out, I might find that I'm spending more money in relationship to how much I make and these guys that make no effort at all to requeen just split their bees and let the chips fall where they may. And then, of course, you know, I have much better overwintering and all of that stuff, but uh, I pay a price for it, you know. Yeah, my uh, my buddies down here that kind of are my younger guys that are kind of my newer mentors, are, <clears throat> they just will split like in early spring, really almost too early it seems like, but they'll they'll find some cells somewhere. And they'll literally split everything and then just drop a queen cell in every colony. Yeah. And uh, that, you know, and that way it just, you, and and I did that this year and had just absolutely tremendous success. I mean, it's just like, you know, I don't know if those new queens come out and kill the old queen. I guess the the bees just figure it out. And then a few of them obviously didn't take, but man, if you can double your colonies and if you have a 10% loss or 20% loss, you're still way above where you started. 
Mm-hmm. You know, and so it's, well, it's know, a neat, some, neat thing. Some of, some of what I do, I'm convinced, is vanity. Like, I'll give you an example. If you look at my outfit, you know, my boxes are reasonably good. They're not perfect, but we got decent equipment. Well, there's a cost to that, too. And guess what? The bees don't care. I mean, <laughs> right, the bees absolutely. just don't care. So why are all these boxes looking good and painted and nice? And that's my vanity. And, uh, you know, we could look at the queen in, this, in, in the same way, you know. I want to do the best I can. Well, maybe doing the best I can isn't the most efficient way, you know. So, But it's, it's just how I have to do it. And Greg can tell you. We got good equipment. I like good stuff. I like good trucks. I like good things. And I want my bees to be good, too. And I'm probably paying a price for that. Uh, like Maybe vanity is the wrong word, but that's the word I'm going to use. Well, you laugh about it, but, you know, you know, tonight's topic, really, uh, at least the, the train of thought is the art of beekeeping. There is definitely something to be said when you know your boxes are right. And you know that your lids are solid and you know you have all the equipment in place to do the job, actually exercise the art of beekeeping. And of course, you know, like you mentioned earlier, the definition of of art is, you know, developing the skills over over from experience. You know, experience has showed you that, yes, you can let these ratty boxes go for X amount of time. Then it becomes a problem or these lids. And then they can mm-hmm. finally be a problem. There, There is something to be said about the I don't I don't I, I think I would. I don't want to say I would disagree with you, Bob. Knowing you, I don't think you having nice equipment is an attempt at vanity. There, there is a certain aesthetic quality that when you are putting yourself in with the right brushes, the right paints, the right mm-hmm. canvas, now you as the artist can create and you well, can do all the things that you need to. You're not going to be doing that if you're tripping over broken mm-hmm. boxes and you're throwing stuff away or you're getting frustrated. Well, so I if, think nothing, that, if nothing else, it makes me feel good. I'm going to ask you to give me 10 seconds. I'm going to go over to my bookshelf. I want to read to you the foreword of 50 Years Among the Bees. If you give me 10 or 20 seconds, I'm going to go find It's right on this topic. It's brilliant. I want to go find that book. Okay. Brian, what do you say we go ahead and uh, we'll take care of the next, uh, tonight's second giveaway, the grand uh, giveaway tonight, of course, um, coming up here soon is a nuke. Um, that has that uh, a queen that is the blend of uh, Bob's Southern Appalachian Queens and a blend of our Northern. That's going to be our grand prize for tonight, though. For our second giveaway, you can go right to our website, naturesimagefarm.com, to find more information about these. If you're interested in bucket plugs or feeders, we have those here, too. Tonight, I want to give away four of these bucket feeders. We'll ship them to you. They've, these have been a game changer for us growing um, from backyard to sideline and then some, they're a, they're a big deal. And so I want to give four of those away uh, tonight. So if you're interested in that, just do hashtag buckets in the comments below. And then Brian will work his magic and uh, kind of get all that uh, queued up and we'll get them shipped out. But especially this time of year, uh, making sure the bees have feed is, is a real big deal. So mm-hmm. hit that comment, uh, hashtag buckets, and then uh, we'll catch up with that here on the Wheel of Fortune <laughs> Here wow. soon. Bob, did you did you find the book? Oh, yes, I did. I, I had just about given up. It's sitting right here in front of me. On I got a pile of books about this high, and I didn't realize it was there. Okay. This is an old book. Oh, wow. Okay. wow, look at that. This is an old book. That's awesome. Yeah, let me, uh, this is cool. I like this forward. This is uh, 50 Years Among the Bees by Dr. C.C. C. Miller. And he wrote a lot of articles for Bee Culture Magazine and uh, I guess maybe American Bee Journal, too, a long time ago. And you're going to hear how long ago when I read this uh, this forward to this book. Okay, here we go. Introduction. You ready? <laughs> okay. One morning, five or six of us who had occupied the same bedroom the previous night during the North American Convention at Cincinnati in 1882, were dressing in preparation to another day's work. Among the rest were Bingham of Smoker fame and Vandervoort, the foundation millman. And I think it was Professor Cook who was chaffing these inventors saying something to the effect that they were always at work studying how to get up something different from anybody else. And if they needed an implement, they would spend a dollar in a day's time to get up one of their own make rather than pay 25 cents for one that was better 
and already made. Vandervoort, who said contemplatively, who sat contemplatively, running, rubbing his shins, replied, but they take a world of comfort in it. And I think all beekeepers are possessed of more or less the same spirit. Their own inventions and plans seem to be best to them. And in many cases, they are right to the extent that two of them, if they were to, if they had almost opposite plans, would be losers if they exchanged those plans. So I think that that's kind of along the same the same thing we're talking. It's what what you do if it makes you feel good and you're happy, you know, that mm -hmm. that part of it, you know, that's part of the key to success. You feel good about what you're doing, uh, even if it's completely different than somebody else. Uh, it, it can lead to success, you know. Greg, your mic's off. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree with that. That's one reason they say. You know, you ask five beekeepers a question, get 10 different answers. Yeah. It's because yeah. different things work differently for different people. So, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. it. I like that, Bob, because it, it speaks to, I think, a, a few things. But, you know, one thing it, it kind of uh, reinforces that there's there's plenty of room at the table, not just um, to uh, collaborate with folks at whatever level that it is, but you can entertain different ideas. You can share different ideas. You can have a different way of doing things altogether. It doesn't make one right or wrong. It's whatever is, is, is acknowledging and being in tune with what is working for you and your bees and your context for whatever goals that you have. And I think appreciating the individuality of that is really cool because once you get past the, the this is a the right way or the wrong way or somebody else's way or mimicking or copycat or cookie cutter approach, now you're all of a sudden into this whole new realm of beekeeping where it's you, it's your bees, and you're looking at the feedback in that relationship to make decisions, to make choices, to move things forward a certain way. And I think that's a big deal. If you are trying to, if you are involved in the, the actual, the act, the art of beekeeping, you kind of have to be in tune with those things. Otherwise you're just exercising the same act that everybody else is. Yeah. Yeah. I think doing it your way truly is the art of beekeeping. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we've got, um, I've got, uh, we don't want to keep you all night, Bob. We appreciate you being on here. We've, I've kind of got, well, I've got a, a kind of a heavy question um, that I think is going to, it speaks to um, a lot of us. A lot of us have gone from, um, you know, backyard scale to um, sideline scale. We're growing the sideline and we're at the precipice of, okay, how much further do we go? We're putting all this time and, and energy um, and effort in, into, this thing that we feel called or drawn to um, for some folks, it's straight up business for some folks. They don't know. They just, this is the path that they're on. They're going where the river takes them. Um, I know in the past, um, in the podcast that you did with us um, and also the videos that you did with us, the country beekeeper show, we kind of touched on a little bit of this, of your growth. Um, you got to you know recognize and appreciate Delmer for putting you on the path. You've grown, um, at the rate that you have, um, uh, Dan helped influence this question. Um, and I'm going to paraphrase and maybe add a little to it is as Bob, as you have grown, um, um, and you have been walking this path for all these years, have you ever gotten to a point to where you have felt like, uh, quitting or that you've been burnt out or that you were at the end of the rope? Um, if so, what have you done? to kind of get work through, get past that and to motivate you to kind of dig in and kind of keep moving forward. Was there ever a point in time where you really had to rein things back and reevaluate before you could move forward? Well, the answer is yes. I have had a couple occasions where I was burned out, but the, the answer to the problem will surprise you. I just had to get some rest. <laughs> I was just tired. Yeah. You know, when I get really well rested and, and I'm actually right now today, I'm the end of the season. I'm burned out. I'm tired. I, I didn't even know how well I would be with you guys tonight. I don't know if you can tell my eyes are red. I'm just fried. I'm overworked. And, and uh, here I am thinking, do I really want to do this anymore at the pace I'm doing it? And, uh, I, I, it happens every year. And then about November, I get well rested and my brain starts coming up with creative ideas and suddenly I'm on the path to growth again. 
right now today, just today, I just I guess I'm going to share with you kind of a deep dark secret here. Just today, I called up my uh, CPA and went and spent an hour with him. I'm at a crossroads in my career here. You know, this business is darn near paid for, which is a place I've never been before. I just, uh, you know, I've made a lot of money over the years, but it's all gone back into the business. That's why we have this place and I have this stuff, you know. I There's been right up till two or three years ago, I had employees making bigger checks than I was. But it didn't mean I wasn't making money. I just wasn't seeing it because I was pouring it back into paying off assets and improving equipment and all that stuff. So uh, right now, today, I went, I went in and talked to the bookkeeper and I said, I need to see a P&L. I want to see where we're standing. And the number of the profit this year so far was truly mind blowing. I thought this can't be so. And she said, Bob, this is what it is. She says, You're, this is how much you've made so much this year. And so now that I don't have the debt to pay off, suddenly I'm going to be putting a serious amount of money in my bank account next year. And I'm thinking, well, wait, okay. I've never had this experience before. Mm. So what do I do? Do I start piling money into the bank account or do I keep growing? I'm 69 years old <laughs> in just a few weeks. Okay. Oh, wow. So, you know, do I just say, okay, I, you know, the growth is over. I'm just going to, you know, ride the ride wow. the vehicle and, you know, sell out in a few years and, you know, ride away into the sunset or, or do I want to keep pushing? You know, I have these creative ideas. I know what I want to do. I want to add, you know where it's at, Greg. I want to add on another addition on the back of the building back there so I can yeah. move the extracting room and move the comb room out the back door and then move the, the honey pouring processing room let it overflow into the extracting room so all everything can get bigger. Mm. But to do that, I take on another four or $500,000 in debt. So I had a very serious conversation with my uh, CBA today, and I'm, I just really don't know quite what to do. So do um, I keep on growing or do I just, uh, my whole life I've been in this growth mode, bigger, yeah. better, more, go for it. And now suddenly today I'm thinking, well, what do I do now? Do I, is it time to start thinking of retiring or do I, do I want to keep thinking of growth? I, I'm not really sure what to do to tell you the truth. I'm at a crossroads. Have you ever been at that crossroad before where it felt like, okay, I'm, I've, I'm pushing so hard and here's the result. Is, is that what causes, do you think, um, the burnout or is it just sheer exha exhaustion over the years? It's, it's getting tired. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this has happened many years for me at the end of the year. I'm just tired. Yeah. And we all know this. Everybody I'm looking at on the screen, when you get tired, you get you get testy. You yeah. you know, you're pay, you lose your patience, you know. Uh you 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 know, you're just you, well and your your thoughts aren't as clear either. You that, know, when you're, right. when you're you're fatigued, absolutely right. You're just not you're not going to be in the right mindset. And there's there's days, even even at my scale, there's days where I'm just super fatigued from work. And I walk out into my apiary, and after checking one colony, I just walk away. Yeah. Because I'm just not in the right mindset. I'm too tired. And then once you go back and you are rested, and you're, it's almost like you just flip that reset. You yeah. know, your mind is clear. And, you know, you, you approach those colonies in a certain calm manner, other than being fatigued and just let's get it done and, you know, the whole experience with them is different when you are rested. Well, something else occurs, and Greg, I think you'll appreciate this. And when you're tired, your intuition doesn't work right. That's right. And when you're really well rested and you feel you feel brilliant and light and, you know, your intuition yeah. works and suddenly, you know, things become clear that weren't clear before. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that for me, that usually starts to happen around November when the dust is settled and I... I'm sleeping good every night and only working eight hours a day, you know, and uh, maybe my question that I'm presenting to you guys, maybe that'll all become clear here in a month or two after I get some rest and get back to normal. Yeah. Um, and I'm very, very guilty um, of just pushing myself too hard. I often get asked, you know, well, why, what's the key? Well, 
you know, why are you successful? And I'll tell you, that it's, it's, it's real simple. I can put it in, in one sentence, and that is that I usually bite off more than I can chew, and then I figure out how to chew it. Yeah. You know, and uh, that's mm-hmm. why I kind of overdo my, I push myself too hard sometimes. Uh, but also in my own defense, it makes me happy. I like to grow. I like to build. I'm a builder. I'm not a sitter. I'm a builder. And if I'm not building, I'm not happy. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot going on in my life, right? You'll know next year. You'll either see in a YouTube video, you'll see a new building going up. <laughs> or not, you know? Uh, there's something intrinsic it seems like with a lot of beekeepers there is just there is something about the challenge challenging ourself um, our thinking um, maybe sometimes even physically but challenging trying to do better digging in growing you can't help but think that and so you know I, I hope you figure out how to if you decide to okay we hit our we hit our growth cap now let's maintain I really want to like to talk to you once you figure it out either yes i'm growing I'll, i'd love to, to pick your brain um and, and have you back on what what was the, the that determining factor to grow and then if you got good with internally and just saying hey you know i've i've done what needed to be done here here's the cap let's maintain this and then see where we go from there i'd love to know the the, the mindset of that because a lot of us struggle constantly you know uh you know this is you know i don't mean anything by this but I, I'm talking about myself and a lot of folks are probably listening. You know, sometimes you feel like it's not good enough. No matter what you do, it's never to where you want it to be. And yeah. even where you get to further than where you projected you wanted to be, it's never good enough. We never take enough time to appreciate the journey every single year. And then it's five years and then it's 10 years and we forget to look back. I think something that I've, I've taken away that just kind of clicked in that last 10 seconds is when Delmer mentioned to look back. I don't know what exactly he meant in that intuitive uh, conversation, but I think it's a reminder for all of us to also, as we grow and we dig and we push, to make sure that we are checking the rear view every now and again and appreciate how far down the road we've traveled, where we've came from, because it's really easy to get discouraged because you're not further up the mountain than you want to be. But the fact of the matter is, man, you're climbing, you're moving forward. That's a big deal, I think, to just take a little bit of time and appreciate that, too. Well, you're absolutely right. And uh, for me, I don't think it's a matter of not appreciating. I, trust me, I'm, I'm in awe of my what's happened here yeah. constantly. And I've really, really enjoyed the journey. It's really satisfying when you build something and it's working. That's very satisfying. And this is going to sound a little corny, but I, I don't know... Bruce and Brian real well, but I know you well enough, Greg, to know that you're going to appreciate this. And part of this thing is service. Yeah. I once uh, read a clip from a, a man that said, you know, as long as we are bre- breathing, how did it go? I'm going to paraphrase. As long as we are breathing uh, the, uh, God's fresh air, it's our uh, duty to, uh, to contribute and mm-hmm. provide a service. Mm-hmm. I'm paraphrasing. I'm not getting the words right, but that's the gist of it. And, and I like to do that. Not everything I do is about money. I, I'm happy to work and knowing that I'm not going to get something personally out of it. And I really do honestly look at this business as a service. Uh, it's not just a way to make money, but it's a way to, to really uh, contribute to society and, and contribute to the big picture. And I know many of your viewers are going to kind of poo-poo that thing but Greg you know me you know that's how I think I I like to think that I'm helping and uh, and providing a service and this business right here is, is doing just that so that's part of the picture too I think everyone listening I think are very familiar um, with some of the things that we say um, regularly uh, one of those things is it's it's not just about beekeeping it's about being your brother's keeper what we do not only as um, a business um, or as a beekeeper, the bees are, for me, the bees are the conduit um, to the people. And that's where we are really um, put in a position where we can serve others. I, I like to look at it um, as, in, in a way, it, it's a ministry in serving others, doing what we can just to help somebody along their way. If we can help open a door, it might just be a can of WD-40 so the hinges aren't so squeaky. It, we might be helping create a door and we might be opening the door. We might be giving them the courage to walk through the door. 
whatever that it is, when you live that kind of a life um, in service, um, it, it is extremely rewarding. Um, you know, my wife and I, we have seven kids. We're raising them on the farm. We have a roof. We have food. We have clothes. We have a place to create. We have a place to engage with others and express love in all these manners. That That's an incredible blessing. So when, when God wakes me up in the morning and I have breath in my lungs and I'm on my own two feet, the real reward in life is to be able to, to, to be in that position to serve others. And I think, Bob, I know you 100 um, percent believe that. And I think everyone listening does, too. OK, good. Good talk. <laughs> yeah. Bob, we've got we've got uh, we've got one more question for you. Um, uh, but first, everyone is is um, everyone loves giveaways. So, uh, okay. Brian, go ahead and, and give spin the wheel for the uh, the bucket giveaway. And uh, while we're doing that, um, if you're if, if giveaways are your thing, uh, be sure to tune in over on the Bohemia Bees YouTube channel on October 19th at 8 p.m. Uh, Jason's got it going on there. His, his channel is getting ready to hit 10,000 subscribers. So definitely uh, join in for the fun. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, if he hasn't haven't subscribed, go subscribe as well. Surge on Jason's channel. R. Okay. Uh, we'll have to verify your uh, YouTube status and email, and we'll get you an email. And uh, we'll get you f uh, four buckets with the plugs sent out to you. I'm just going to make a note here. And then, Brian, can you do a backup spin on that one? I'll have to key it in again. I, I, ki I killed okay. it. We'll, we'll figure it out. That's okay. Yeah, um, here. We've, we've got one more. We've got a question. Uh, that's okay, Brian. We've got uh, a question from uh, a good friend of ours, uh, Jose Uribe, the California beekeeper, Uribe Honeybees out of California. Um Brian's going to cue um, that question up. But in the meantime, let's go ahead and uh, let's get past um, before uh, Bob answers the, the question oh. here. Let's go ahead and actually we'll, we'll, we'll end with we'll end with the giveaway. Go ahead. And let's let's play the question and get Bob's uh, his response to it. Hey, what's going on, everyone? Bob, hey. I have a question for you. I know your beekeeping ventures began in the West Coast. Yeah. Um, now you're in the East Coast. So my question is, what were those adjustments that you had to do in beekeeping? Um, just asking for a friend. I'm out here in Tennessee, over here in Chattanooga. Oh. I don't know. Tennessee's looking kind of nice. Okay, so re-ask the Maybe. question. I, I missed one or two words. Re-ask. Re can he hear I, me okay? No, it was, it was pre-recorded. The question oh, was, what adjustments did you, your beekeeping did you have to make going from California Coast? Um, or going from the West east, Coast to so Georgia, question, what adjustments have what you had to make with your beekeeping? I think I think he was still um, going. Is he still going? Just asking for a friend. I'm out here in Tennessee. It's on a loop, so it'll play again. Okay. All right, no, I think I got it now. Looking kind of nice. Yeah, well, there was Maybe. some. It, it's it's different here. Maybe. My rock and roll. Okay, my uh, yeah. my emphasis of how I do business here is much different. On the West Coast, when I was in Southern Oregon, I did the poll. I some of my colonies pollinated four different uh, gigs a year. I'd start in California and do the almonds, then the pears in Southern Oregon, and apples in Washington State, or or uh, cranberries on the coast of Oregon, or cherries up in the Willamette Valley. Whatever, I was always pollinating, and and honey was kind of the the side benefit to all that. When I came here, it's exactly the opposite. I do not. Now I don't pollinate anything anymore, and uh, I I, I change, had to change the way I make the money. Um, we go after uh, honey production, bee production, honey packing, in other words, buying and packing and selling honey, and then our retail store. So that's the adjustment I made is that the pollination in Georgia is here, but it's nothing like it is on the West Coast. So I had to change the way I looked at things. And uh, let's see, how, what else? Well, you know, honestly, Sourwood provided me a lot of opportunity here. You don't make it every year, but when you do, it's such a high dollar crop that that, that really was param of paramount importance in this honey production aspect of my business. Out here, I, I finally came to the conclusion that you have to diversify your income. You need more than one iron in the fire. 
out on the West Coast, you know, the pollination really drove my business. And, you know, I only had that one big iron in the fire and then a minor uh, iron in the fire with the sales of honey. Out here, I've got four major irons in the fire. And in Tennessee, I would say it'd probably be the same situation. You, you know, there's not a lot of pollination opportunities right in Tennessee. I think you would have to uh, concentrate more on honey production and, and bee production. There's a, a tremendous uh, potential for uh, selling nukes and packages and things right there in Tennessee and Queens too. The season starts later, of course. Um, but uh, I think it's just about how you, how are you going to make your money and get used to the humidity? Cause it ain't <laughs> the West coast is way different. <laughs> it's a great question there. Uh, Brian, if you would, let's uh, go ahead and, and give away um, the, the grand prize giveaway uh, for tonight. It's a, uh, a spring nuke uh, here from Nature's Image Farm, uh, which is going to include uh, that Appalachian Mutt Queen, which like we've talked about earlier today, has started off with, uh, you know, Bob giving us some tools um, I'm gonna, to help I'm going to do the backup for the buckets. Oh, and then this the buckets first. Yep. OK, so, Darren. And I also want to thank Darren Cap. He just joined the channel as a member. Uh, so, Darren, thanks for that. We'll put Darren as the backup for the buckets. Is that what we're doing, Brian? Yep. Yeah, Darren will be the backup. Darren's the backup for the buckets. And then um, thanks for uh, joining the, the, the channel as a member, Darren, and for all the folks who uh, sent a, uh, a super chat, uh, Bruce, Brian, Lisa. And if I missed anybody else, I'm sorry, but we appreciate you. Thanks for doing that. Um, the, the nuke, of course, is for pickup only. Uh, we're here uh, in the Hopewell, Zanesville area of Ohio. Uh, that'll be available late May, uh, early June, however the weather kind of unfolds. And uh, like we mentioned earlier, it's going to be a five-frame nuke um, that's going to have our Appalachian Mutt Queen, which is heavily influenced by um, the genetics that we blended from from Bob and our and our, our uh, Ohio stock here. So uh, I guess, Brian, we'll, what should we do here? Have everyone just uh, hashtag 2023 nuke. Yep. And then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll hit that there towards the end there. Bob, I want to yeah. thank you for, for taking some time with us, um, you know, tonight. I wondered if you had any, any final thoughts um, that you wanted to share um, about the art of beekeeping, what that means to you. Well, first, I want to ask a question. I heard the 10,000 subscribers. Who is the who is? Is that you? No, not a no, uh, Bohemia Bees. Jason Crook He's up over in the Maryland area. Bohemia and Bees. And he's got 10,000 subscribers. He's getting real close. Yep. Wow. Cool. That's that's getting up there. Yeah. Um, the art of beekeeping. Well, I think we said a lot about the art of beekeeping. This may be a little different subject, but I think, you know, to be successful at beekeeping, it really and I throw this word out there. It came and keeps making me famous for it. And that is tenacity. Uh, it really takes a lot of tenacity. You have to be tenacious to be successful if the, at this. If you at, at if you're going to be a hobbyist, maybe not so much, but as a sideliner or making your living at it, you've got to be willing to take the ups and the downs together. And uh, I, I always tell people, people ask me, what's your honey average? I say, well, uh, you need to ask for the 10 year average, not the one or two year average. And because we all know there's those bad years in there. I've seen several beekeepers go out of business. They, they, they borrow a bunch of money because they've had a few good years with their 15 colonies and they pencil it out and go, I can make money at this. And just to have two or three bad years in a row and they get out of the business, um, you, you just got to be willing to take the ups and the downs. I know that has nothing to do with the art of beekeeping, but it's just a word of advice. If you're going to be in it for the long haul, you got to think about the long haul and be tenacious and, you know, and, and plus the mistakes, oh my goodness, the art of beekeeping really comes with, with having made so many mistakes. I, I like to tell people, it's not that I'm all that smart, it's just that I've been doing this 40 years, and after a while, some things start to stick. <laughs> you screw something <laughs> up enough times, eventually you go, wait a minute now, maybe I'm doing this wrong. And uh, I guess that's part of the art of beekeeping too. That comes down to the experience part. Um, just hang in there. I, I feel so sorry for people that, you know, uh, get a colony or two or 10 and uh, have a good year or two. And then when it goes bad, they just give up. I wish I could talk people into just hanging in there a little longer. Uh, I think they would, uh, would enjoy themselves in the long run if they could just hang in there during the down times. 
I know that's kind of a downer. I don't mean to end this all on a down note, but I'm just trying to be encouraging, tell people to mm-hmm. hang in there, stick with it. Yeah. And that's, those are great words. I mean, this is mm-hmm. the time of year where um, I know a lot of us um, are, we, we, we do we feel, we feel tired. We feel burned out. We're questioning everything. And if yeah. we have, if we know ourself, um, then we know we do this every year and we, we try to remind ourselves that and just, get, get rest, you know, we're kind of reorganize our thoughts mm-hmm. because it's, it's easy to kind of go down that, th- those dark thoughts and, and uh, second guess everything. So, you know, sharing that with us, Bob, um, is tremendous. I, I will never, um, as long as I live, for, never forget you looking back and smiling as we're driving down the road and saying, I, there's days I still don't know what I'm doing. There is such a freedom <laughs> um, in it. And if, you, if, if, if Bob Benny doesn't know what he's doing sometimes from day to day, it, that that's that there's a lot of freedom for us that, that we can get in there. We can make those mistakes. We can gain that experience. We can build those skills as we develop our own individual arts of beekeeping. And I think that's a really, really big deal. Brian, you want to hit that, um, go ahead and hit the, uh, the winner. We'll probably want to do a backup in case they don't want to come to Ohio sure. to pick it up. So go ahead and spin the wheel. Frank Lane. Lane. Okay. Congratulations, Frank Lane. That'll be pickup here in Zanesville, Ohio in uh, late May or early June. And then Brian, you're going to do a a second uh, backup on there. The backup will be, I saw Dan on there. (laughs) Dan's trying hard. (laughs) (laughs) James James Miller. Miller. Okay. All right. So if you've won uh, the honey sampler, the buckets, the nuke, be sure to send us an email at naturesimagefarm uh, at gmail.com. We'll get with you and, um, and kind of make um, all those arrangements. Um, Bob, as we close out, I just want to thank you again oh, yeah. for, for taking the time to, you know, one thing um, that I think you've, you know, whether you, you're a, you're a very humble um, kind of guy, and I know you don't you know, want the accolades and you're not looking for um, uh, the respect, but I think, uh, the, the type of guys that gain it are the ones that aren't looking for it. And there's a lot of us out there that owe an, an awful lot of um, the success we're finding with our beekeeping on our paths because of you being humble, sharing what it is that you are doing, um, that the, 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 the serving others and all the ways that you do is, is making a tremendous impact on folks. I've, I've said it before. I'll keep seeing it, saying it. You know, you have been the lighthouse on the hill um, I know for us and for so many that if it weren't for the lighthouse, I'm not sure where the ship would be. So, Bob, I want to thank you again for taking the time uh, and, and for being um, just being you, being that lighthouse to others. Thanks again uh, for taking some time for us tonight. Thank you, Greg. That's nice. Thank you very much. Thanks, um, in, in, in closing here, um, we, we've talked about the art of beekeeping um, and the art of life is goes hand in hand. You, you can't help not see the art of everything once you're in tune um, with the art and, and, and acting um, kind of under those tenets. Uh, today, you know, our, our family lost um, somebody who was a true artist by every sense um, of the word. Uh, Susie lost her grandpa, Fred, today. Uh, for those that knew Fred, he was a one of a kind. Um, that old bird, Ferd, introduced me um, to art. He introduced me to jazz, introduced me to Miles Davis, Dave Brubeck, Art Blakey. Uh, Fred was also a photographer. He, Fred got me down the path. He set me on the path and gave me tools for photography. Um, take the time to kind of mentor me through that. We would send photos back and forth and was a huge inspiration um, for us in learning the art of photography, but also capturing nature, capturing that shot, looking for the shot, seeing those things everywhere, finding the art and absolutely everything and capturing that. Um, and we, I owe that to, to Fred Bishop. Fred passed on today. Um, Fred, like I said, was a huge influence. When I think of Fred, uh, I, I think of one um, particular song. Um, and as an homage to, to Fred, I want to dedicate tonight's talk, The Art of Beekeeping, to Fred Bishop. And um, Brian, if you would, I want you to spend that track for old Fred. Old Fred, take five.